Happy Thursday, hashtag my global family. This is Dre Abeta, coyote walking in this world, real life as Slato Pueblo superhero. Proud to spirited indigenous warrior. And I have roots family from not only Asleta, but Laguna, Akama, and the Philippines. And I am here with my amazing global family of superheroes. Welcome this evening to episode nine of our amazing podcast. Can you believe it, family? I cannot wait to get started tonight and share my amazing family with you. So tonight, welcome to Hashtag Coyotes Global Superhero Family Podcast Episode 9, Hashtag Letting Go of the Old While Hashtag Embracing the New. And I am always your host, Dre Abeda, Coyote Walking in This World. And I am joined this evening with my amazing sisters from around the world. First, we have Dr. Rija Su, Adria Manana, Hashtag Dr. Rija Su who is also the amazing, brilliant, talented, former Minister of Education of Madagascar. Also the proud mother of my amazing niece, who is just starting her first term at CNM family, and my nephews, who are currently a senior and junior at the University of New Mexico. Next, we have my amazing sister, Tomei, who is a superhero in the area of restorative justice family. She is a powerhouse and is hailing right now from the Bronx in New York City. Then we have my amazing sis, Leah, hashtag scholarship seeker with a background in educational psychology, who is currently joining us from Indonesia, who is also the amazing mother of my niece, Hazel, and my nephew, Asuk. I am sending my love to my nephews and niece from far away. And lastly, family, we have my bestie and everyday superhero um, companion and uh, adventurer, Carolyn, who literally has been hosting all of our wonderful events with this coyote for the last year and a half with her other sister, Kyla Charlie. Family, at this time, we are going to go ahead and take a few moments for you to introduce yourself to our amazing global family. Who would like to go first? Why don't we start in New York? Because that's it's late, very late over there. I don't know if you agree with me. You, yes, <laughs> you're absolutely correct. It is late in New York and it's snowing. I'm Tomei, truth teller, and I am excited to be here with you. I'm so happy to come on as late as it is live from New York. Um, it's just amazing because I feel privileged to be here with these amazing women in this space. And so, I normally don't like to introduce myself and lead with any credentials because for me, it's about connecting to your humanity and not the letters behind your name. Um, so just so you know, I am a social worker and I am a PhD student in the Education for Social Justice program at USD. And more importantly, I am a mom of two college graduates and a grandma with one on the way. <laughs> So that's a little bit about me. I love um, to sing and I write poetry and do some other things and you'll find out as we go on. So thank you for being here tonight and I am going to pass this on to the next lovely person. I can go next. Thank you, Tame. Uh, I'm Malia. Hi everyone, um, I'm from Indonesia and I studied educational psychology back in 2015 to 2017 uh, at the University of New Mexico and I'm currently teaching at a local uh, university in my hometown of North Sumatra. Thank you. Yeah, Caroline, will you go? Because I'm I would like to, to hear more from you and about you. Okay, Please. thank you. Um, my name is Carolyn Finke, and I am um, Andrea's chief communications officer. And I am 
an artist on sabbatical, I guess we'll say. I'm not creating art at the moment, but I have been an artist. Um, I have a degree from the University of New Mexico since the Lobos are in uh, attendance here tonight. I have a bachelor's in communicative disorders and I am a dog mom of two little dogs who you will see on the couch behind me at various times throughout the night. And that's all. Thank you for joining us, family. This is Carolyn's second visit with us on the podcast. Um, Rija and Leah have been with us the entire time. And this is Sister Tomei's first visit. Don't forget, family, in addition um, to sharing our wonderful lives with you, as researcher activists who are literally and educators who are here to change the world, we are currently engaging in research. So this podcast is a form of qualitative data collection family. We are literally proving that we can change our world by literally interacting with you on social media. And sis Rija, would you like to go ahead and do your intro, sis? Yes, um, this is Rija. Uh, my full name is Rija Suandiamanana Josoa. And uh, I graduated from the University of New Mexico where I met uh, I see Andrea back in 2018. So I graduated in 2019. And then I, I got back home. I was appointed as the Minister of Education of Madagascar. And then I, um, now I am a, an assistant professor at my hometown university, which is my dream job because uh, I come from a small town in Madagascar. and. Now it has a university and I'm so proud to serve back my community. And um, I love uh, global families. I love uh, interacting and networking with different people. So it is always a pleasure for me to be part of this podcast. It's an opportunity to speak English, especially because we speak Malagasy or French all the time in Madagascar. So thank you, Andrea, for hosting this podcast. Always my pleasure, sis. Always my pleasure. Family, we start our podcast with an opening prayer. I am Dre Abeda, coyote walking in this world, real life a subtle purple superhero, and proud two-spirit indigenous warrior. I'm also a researcher, an activist, a scholar, a vlogger with 19,000 followers on seven social media platforms. Please check me out tomorrow, family, at 11 a.m. Mountain Time on the platform Clubhouse. This coyote is going to be a guest along with BJ Rainbow on the show Ask a Native that is hosted by my amazing brother, Tracy Peterson. It's going to be an adventure, family, and we are basically here to change the world. I have been loving, growing, collecting my siblings from around the world because together, when our hopes and dreams are literally dependent upon each other, our success will happen. It has to happen because the nieces and nephews that I have around the world and my partner and I's future children, all of our lives depend on making the change that we have already been promising our children for generations. So family, today, as we say a prayer, if you are not a praying person, please set an intention for your life, for your day, for the brand new year. This coyote is former pastor of Coyote's Lodge, House of Spirituality, Critical Race Theory, and Medical Marijuana. Our services are on Wednesdays, family. Now I prefer just being your coyote and sibling. And don't forget in Coyote's Lodge, when we pray, we are not a religion or a house of God or institutionalized but rather we are simply saying hello to our ancestors and asking for their guidance and blessings. Gammy, it's your favorite trickster coyote grandchild. I've been up to no good again, and I'm stressed about it, Gammy. Today, our very special prayer with our theme in mind of letting it go. 
Yeah, I mean, we have the weight of the world on our shoulders and every day, even though it's filled with new opportunities, sense can sometimes be clouded by doubt, by anxiety, by the uncertainty that COVID has brought into all of our lives. And what we need, Yami, is we need some rest. So our prayer today is to ask for help and guidance in letting go. Allow us to lift the burden from our shoulders and let go of negativity. Allow us to let go of the anxiety that has seemed to be a constant companion in the last two years. Allow us to let go of the stress, the pain and the suffering and the worry that has been riding our minds. It is time for us to start healing and to recover because we have work to do. So Gammy, our prayers today is for a bright future and for allow us to start letting go of the burdens we have in our life and allow us to plant the new seeds of hope and love, knowing that we're working towards not alone, not islands, not people who are in a vacuum, but rather part of a huge network of families who are around the world. And together, when we put our efforts together, we can do anything. Dear Papa, it's your favorite trickster coyote grandchild. I miss you, Papa. There was nothing that you could not solve in this world when we walked the fields and admired your rows of green chili. When you were in the fields irrigating and watering your beans and your crops or taking care of our house and we were filled with worry, we would find you and tell you all about our day. You would look at us you would give us a hug and take us into the kitchen, make us a snack and say, Hita, pumpkin, it's going to be okay. You tell Papa about it all. And in that manner, Papa, you lifted my burdens throughout my childhood and may everyone around the world find such a listening ear. Allow them to find someone who will listen with an open mind and an open heart and allow us to let go of the past so we can live in the present and look forward to the future. May you rest in peace, Papa. And to all of my ancestors, my great great grandpa Pablo Beta, a true revolutionary and a sled of Pueblo statesman. Dear sir, we are still filled with pain and our lives have not gotten better. We are still seeking hope and guidance from our leaders elected, appointed, and allow them to create humanizing change. We need for them to listen to us and not believe of the idolization of what they think is happening, but live in the reality that is affecting all of our lives. May all of our ancestors, gammies, papas, uncles, cousins, our blood and those who adopted us, Treat us with kindness and human respect. May you send us your blessings and guidance as we, your modern warriors, continue to thrive and fight for our lives in this modern era. May we continue to walk the path that you started for us. Would anyone like to add anything to our prayer this morning, this evening? Nope, you're right. It, it can be morning, it can be evening. It's morning here. So you're right. No worries. <laughs> Very true, sis. I forget, family. It is 5 a.m. at 8 o'clock during mountain time, 5 a.m. for my sis in Indonesia. And it's actually 9 a.m. for my sis. Uh, oh, excuse me. It is 5 a.m. for my sis in Madagascar, and it is 9 a.m. for my sis in Indonesia. So yes, it is morning and it is evening all around the world. All right, family, we're going to go ahead and get started with our sections this evening. Let us see what we have in store. So tonight, family, as we do with every episode, we start with one 
of the tenets of this coyote's original indigenous based critical race theory, walking as coyote, in which ordinary people step up to become extraordinary during times of need. And if COVID is not a time of need, family, then this coyote does not know what is. Tenant for this evening is the weight of the world, responsibility, sacrifice, and becoming more. With great power comes great responsibility, Uncle Ben Spider-Man. We are all children of the modern era. Every human being has ancestors that made sacrifices so we might survive and thrive today. We acknowledge the history of superheroes that have risen from within our communities. Therefore, as superheroes, we understand that sacrifice and dedication to becoming more is part of our responsibility as we train, grow, and defend our communities. Additionally, we knowingly accept the burden of violence that comes with defending and protecting our communities and will take steps towards self-care and recovery. What the heck are those guys doing, Adam? They're swimming to Alcatraz, was what I said. What the hell for? To take it for the Indian people. Adam, fortunate eagle, invading Alcatraz, 1999. From November 20th, 1969 to June 11th, 1971, there was a 19 month occupation of Alcatraz. In protest of what was being done to indigenous peoples during the civil rights movement, during the attack of the American Indian movement, during a time when people of color were under attack by the United States government, as we still are today. This reminds me that while we engage in battle, the weight of the world seems to be on our shoulders. And as we take up the mantle of superhero hood, we understand that the sacrifices, that the dedication, that the responsibility that we have to our people is important and it matters. Our very first segment today, family, as always, is our hashtag superhero check-in, in which our amazing podcasts go in um, order or in turn, and they talk about the hashtag battle of the week, which is going to be our low point or a struggle, something we had to overcome, and our hashtag superhero moment, which is usually something that we triumphed over and something we like to share. Who would like to start us off this evening? Dr. May, would you like to start? Just share the high and the low. I know you it's your first time, but you can do this. High and the low. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, my low. My, my low of the week, I think, has been... Um, just that my allergies honestly at this point because keeping in alignment with um the theme for tonight i've let go of a lot of stuff and since i last spoke with um dre i had to let go of a lot of things so i can actually experience my super hero moment <laughs> which is actually leaning more into myself Right, um, because what I've learned is that people go from self-preservation and they do things to just preserve themselves and what they think they hold on to versus leaning into how can I cultivate myself? How can I be with myself? So I had a breakthrough where I really leaned into myself and things that might've triggered me Years ago, it's like, oh, okay, I can recognize it and see it. And so when that thing happened this past week and I had to reflect and say, oh, you didn't even react. You were able to notice and attend to yourself. And I checked in with me to just make sure I was all right. So for me, that's my superhero moment. Thank you. Who's gonna go next? Yeah, Indonesia. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, where do I even start with the lows? Uh, I think I have uh, several um 
things that make me not feeling the best myself to, uh, this week. The first one is um, my two kids are sick, like both, as, both at the same time. And so even like last night, I literally only have like three and a half hours of sleep. And I'm seriously beaten right now. But I guess the good thing is that I, regardless of, you know, how hectic it is, you know how whiny kids can be when they're sick, right? But so whenever I go back home, I, I can never touch my laptop or, you know, anything related to my work from the office. Uh, so, but regardless of the, the chaotic situations that I have right now, with the kids being sick, I managed to finish a couple of important deadlines with my work. So, you know, that's something to be proud of, I guess. Yeah, over to Rija, I guess. Um, and let's listen to Caroline first, because I would like to hear the, the new people. I mean, let's alternate because we are here. We are, you know, every week, every week. So Caroline, would you like to go? I will go. Um, my, what are we calling it? What's the down? Um, battle of the week. Battle of the week. My battle of the week is, I hate to, you'll hear me say this a lot and I don't mean to overuse it, but um, I am a person living with severe depression. And so my battle of the week tends to always be battling my depression. So I'll just say that and throw that out there without going into a whole lot of detail because, um, well, I will go into a little bit of detail. Um, battling depression is um, having messed up sleep cycles, um, having no appetite or having obsessing about food um, and various other things that we'll leave for another time. Um, but that's, that's the down. The upside is that I um, was in the classroom. I'm a substitute teacher and hadn't been in the classroom since before Thanksgiving. And so I was in the classroom again this week and it was a good day. Um, I was in a gifted classroom. So that's kind of cheating because there are always good students when you're in a gifted classroom usually. Um, so that's my, my upside. Congrats sis, that's huge. That's huge. Yes, it is, it is considering I'm being really picky about the classes that I choose to sub for, that it is huge. <laughs> and we'll go okay. to Rita. Yes, um, well, the battle of the week is um, that after the third uh, wave of COVID, I think I finally got it, couldn't. Mm. Uh, yeah, I am. Uh, I at, at first I thought it was a flu, <clears throat> and then um, on day six because I like to uh, journal it, like how my um, general state is, uh, how am I doing generally? Then day six I started to lose um, taste and uh, smell. I was like, yeah. I got this thing. So I, um, I, I've been, since day one, I was, you know, taking some um, vitamins and magnesium and zinc and all the things that make you strong. But then I called my doctor when I started to lose uh, the smell, the sense of smell and, uh, and uh, taste and then they gave me the specific medicine for it like antibiotics and you know for the COVID we did we don't do test we don't have enough tests in the country like this we don't we don't do that you just you know 
well, there is, but it takes like three days and so on. You're not going to play your health with that. So you just call your private doctor and they prescribe you. Then you got you went to the pharmacy and you get the medicine. So it was like, well, I finally, you know, like uh, it's been, uh, it's, it's the third wave in Madagascar here. So I'm still, I consider myself lucky because a lot of people are struggling their life right now uh, with it. And um, I am thankful because I have mild symptoms. So I'm just tired, you know, I can eat, I don't have temperature. And I guess the high of the week is, um, despite all of that, I could meet the deadline like Leah and like all of you guys. We still, you know, life is a combination of high, highs and lows. So I was, um, I am a member of the um, Graduate Student Award Committee for the AAAL or the American Association for Applied Linguistics. And I could still finish, you know, the, my tasks to be part of the committee. Uh, yesterday they called me, not they called me, but they emailed me like, today is the deadline. And then I couldn't work right away, but I said, I need to sleep because with this uh, disease, you become weak, you are weak. And I had to take a nap for two hours before I get the effort to do the 30 minutes work. So um, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that even if I am not feeling well in my body, I can still be part of this podcast because this is an opportunity to get the strength. And as um, Caroline sa said, um, you know, our mood is not always, you know, as what we want. Uh, you didn't say it, but I, you know, like, oh, I'm going to talk about this a lot. And that is life. Actually, that's the normal now with this plus this pandemic, you know, don't, I don't think we should stay away from saying that because if you have a normal, normal life, that means um, it's not life. The, the, the abnormal, not say abnormal, but the struggles and all of that uh, make our life normal, especially during this pandemic. So I'm so, again, I'm thankful for this um, podcast because we share and we exchange uh, struggles and it becomes um, a global, uh, let's say, uh, sharing for us and relationship and especially sisterhood, which is strong and powerful. Thank you. I love that, uh, that thought, that truth, that our family is strong, right? That we are together um family i gotta echo a little bit of both my sister carolyn and um and Rija. um so this is part of my doctoral dissertation project and i make videos um about my daily life and i have my formula right 50 percent cute <laughs> and then i have what i'm trying to more beef up is the critical work right i make videos about my ptsd i'm a survivor of trauma three times over, rape and molestation as a ramification of any boarding school as a child, police brutality in 2008 when I couldn't leave my house for nine months, um, got upgraded to PTSD at that point, and then white male predator in 2018, which I was a witness in a sexual harassment suit. Um, I have survived a lot of trauma and subsequently I have PTSD that affects the way I walk in the world. Um, and I'm trying to normalize it. Right? Why do I have my bathtub videos where I just upchuck my breakfast and now I'm having a panic attack in front of you on live? Um, I'm trying to prove that you can be a superhero and do five impossible things a month and still have a panic attack and feel like you can do nothing. Realize you have to pull yourself together because you feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you go to battle anyways, right? That's what our communities are doing. It's inhumane, um, it's not fair to any of us, it's dehumanizing, it's painful as fuck. And I'm struggling with the rules, right? I have PTSD, which means I live by rules. I don't have OCD as a diagnosis, but my life is 
uh, it's very structured. We have rules in the house. <laughs> Where do you put laundry? What days you do grocery? What days we clean? Um, and it helps me to be calm to have those structures in place. <laughs> My partner, poor, poor bit, 21 years we've been together. Um, and he's learned when those structures are out of whack, I can, I can have a panic attack. I can lose my shit. The pepperoni is wrong because it was supposed to be Italian sausage. I have expectations that help guide my life. And when those get, um, messed with, right. When COVID happens and nothing goes as planned, it kind of knocks my entire world off its access and it's hard to recover. And so. I've been wondering what has made me derail, right? Why am I struggling the second week of classes? My UNM contract started last week and it stresses me out and I can barely function. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself this week, family. This is my second week of full workout, full cardio, my 15 miles. But that take took some getting used to because I had been sick for two weeks. And then last week I was sick. I was sick for Thursday. I shut down. I was sick on Friday. I almost couldn't make it through Monday, but Carolyn got me in the house and Aaliyah got me out for dinner. I had to do work on third Tuesday because I had to. People needed stuff from me. So I forced myself to do work. And then Wednesday, I filmed all day yesterday and I did my dissertation project like I should have. And today I just couldn't do it, family. I couldn't force myself to do work. And then I, I realized why. I am struggling to do work for UNM and I'm struggling to do work for an organization. And both of those places are incredibly triggering for me. And they have been hostile to me. They have hurt me. They have hurt other people and I fight against them. And that's why I feel sick because the first week of school, because classes started this week, remind me of my predator, remind me of how the institution has hurt myself and others around me and how impossible my advocacy work seems some days. So I have lost my shit, I don't know, five out of the last seven days and I've been able to work, but that's okay, family. That's a low, but that's okay. Because I ran the numbers and I figured out why I feel like shit. And I've also come to the conclusion that every year on the first week of classes, I'm gonna have a hard time. And I'm just gonna have to learn to be kind to myself and to be loving and realize that's just okay. Because I still have next week and I'm not alone. I guess that was my low. <laughs> my anxiety and my PTSD has been a bitch. And part of that was okay. It's okay. My high family was when I feel like shit and I can't leave my room. My sisters call and I had promised Carolyn that I was Carolyn, that I was going to have lunch on Monday. And I text canceled like three times. <laughs> and I kept changing my mind because I kept saying I should go. And I ended up going to go see her. And I think that that really helped me get out of the slump. And it helped me prepare for my hell of work on Tuesday. And the same thing with my sis Leah. Because when I felt like shit, both of them help build me back up. And that's why our family's important because we're human and we're flawed, but at the end of the day, they're still gonna love us. All right, family, let's go on to our next segment, which is hashtag positionality matters, digging into intersectionality. And you know, this coyote is an intersectional scholar Please do not be fooled. Intersectionality actually started with Patricia Hill Collins, Black Feminist Thought. It is the ideology, family, and the hashtag truth that when you have an interaction with someone, what facets of your identity, your positionality, had an influence on that interaction? 
Was it your race? Was it your skin color? Was it your citizenship or the language or religion that you have? So during this segment, each one of our podcast guests reflects on one aspect of their positionality. Sis Tome, I believe you're starting us off. Okay. Oh, wow. That is so good. Such a good question. And so it's interesting because I've been talking about this a lot with the intersectionality. But before I respond, I just want to really raise up um, and say thank you for the way you shared um, so so generously, you and Caroline. And um, I connected with a lot of things you, you both said. And that's part of my intersectionality that I have a history of trauma and I know I have a history of trauma. So when I experience certain things and I think that um, I might be responding to a situation because of my, you know, I'm black, that's it. I'm black and I'm, it's visible, right? So let me, I'm ready to come back for it. <laughs> You know, I can't go in a space and pretend to be something I'm not because just clearly by the color of my skin, people will judge me and make assumptions. And for me, I, I really learned that I don't even have just that privilege to say, I know what this is because I'm a black woman and I'm experiencing these comments or certain things. For me, it's really been sitting with myself and having to ask myself, Am I responding from a trauma lens, right? So for me, that's what I've been leaning into and what shows up because I recognize that while I always advocate that people can not receive healing, healing is like learning. We do it every day. Healing is not something that you're just going to get in one snap. Healing doesn't happen in a circle or in a doctor's office. It is a journey. It is not a destination. And I have to recognize that, and that's what I've really been leaning into, my intersectionality as a Black woman with trauma because of sexual harm. So for me, it's been like I heal from sexual harm and then have to attend to racial harm, right? It just is <coughs> constant tension that's happening, you know? So for me, that's why I center on me in the sense of what do I need to lean into self-care? What do I need to lean into self-love? And what do I need to make sure I can maintain some sense of control? Because I need that. I need that structure you spoke of a little while ago. I need that. And, and what, what do I need? So whatever is happening outside of me, external forces that might be saying things to me or impacting me to make sure it doesn't alter my internal sense of self and my internal knowing and intrinsic value. So for me, I'm really leaning into because I've experienced so many horrible things that people will say. So that whole stick and stone, they break my bones and names will never hurt. That's a lie. And that's a myth that we've been teaching you know, and, and all of these nursery rhymes that names will never hurt, but they do. So that's why I appreciate hearing you say earlier, like being kind to yourself. That's what I've been focusing on because I experience cruelty with the words of others because of who I am visibly and even what I have to contend with that they can't see because of the trauma history that I have. Um, I really lean into making sure I'm taking care of me in the process so I don't show up as somebody other than my beautiful self. Yeah, so that would be it for me for now. Leah? Leah. Okay, sorry. Um, right. uh, we're talking about uh, the intersectionality, right? Yes. Um, 
So a couple of days ago, I had a conversation with a, you know, a scholarship seeker as well. So, you know, we have a group here where, you know, the fellow scholarship seekers are sitting together and talk, we talk about the plans with our PhD studies and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, I met this uh, lady uh, from Java. <clears throat> that's another island in Indonesia. Uh, and I, I asked her, where do you want to, where do you plan to go for your PhD program? And she said, well, I'm really interested in going to the US, but you know, with everything going on in the US, I don't think I can take it. I was like, what do you mean? Um, well, you know, I have families, so I, I'm not sure, you know, American kids will like my kids. I'm not sure American kids will like to hang out with my kids if I bring them there. Oh my God, I was like, hey, I'm sorry if you get the message from the media like that, but let me tell you, lots of Americans are actually very nice, but you know, if you come, if you like heard stories about how prejudiced some Americans are, I mean, like people like that exist in Indonesia, in Indonesia too, so, you know, and we're going to be going hanging out with lots of uh, educated people in American campuses. So I think, I mean, I'm just saying it's, well, it's possible, but it's not like, you know, certain, you know, it's only an assumption. So why don't you, you know, try and then let's just hope for the best. And she was like, yeah, I think you're right. Because if that's actually a prejudice in itself, right? She's already assuming you know, how some Americans will treat them very bad because they're Asians. I mean, what do you think it, it is? So, I mean, I, it's very understandable because she's never been, you know, outside of the, in Indonesia, sorry, she's never been going out of Indonesia. So it's, I think it's understandable, but what I'm trying to say is that with, you know, the media portrayal of American Indonesia, she might have, gotten the wrong message but I and then I proceed to tell them about you guys I have you know what I believe it or not I actually have sisters from you know we have podcasts every two weeks and we have we are we're we're getting along very well and they're you know some of them are Americans some of them are you know from outside of the U.S. but some of them are Americans and they're very nice they treat us like sisters and it's just like really yes you know I'm so I guess like my experience that I got in the US ha helps me teach that, um, I mean, racist people are everywhere, even in Indonesia, but it should, should, it should not stop us from, you know, pursuing what we think the best for us. I think that's it. Thank you so much, sis. Yes. I mean, before we go on though, real quick to Carolyn, um, Rija, how, okay, my auntie uncleness is like, ah, you got to prepare them for both. We can be assholes too. I'm just saying. So, but that's because I've experienced racism here. Um, Rija, can you speak on that? How was your experience with your kiddos? Like, I'm, I'm always worried. Even, even though Ruti is like a college student now, I'm still like, Text me when you're going places. Who are you meeting? You know, like making sure she's okay. And I'm sure people are nice. But what was your experience with your kids when they first came to the United States? Well, um, when my kids uh, came, I didn't see the. I, I was so ignorant, okay? Because we are a colonized country. We are colonized by the, by the French people. And um, their, uh, I don't say hatred, but their oppression toward us was very obvious, right? And when we saw American people, we had a very different view. I was like, oh, that's the nicest people in the world. And I was so positive. And I, because it's the first time we saw people to give us things like, for free, you know, like, oh, here's a gift for you because you're French people, you don't experience that. In France, they don't have such a thing like goodwill or stuff you give away things. They don't have that. And I was so naive. And the first year of my PhD, I remember back in 20, 
2012 and 2013, I first learned about racism in America, I was sick because I was so disappointed. I was sick, I couldn't handle it. I was like, man, this because I read, I believe in research and it was a shock for me. And then it was like, wow, so what's all of this? You know, I, ex I experienced uh, many positive things and why is it like this? Why did I study this shit? That's what I told myself. Like why suddenly things and I started to see my life from a different perspective. Like, wow, so they just played the Messiah then and they want us this, this, many things. So I guess I taught my kids about what I studied at school. Like this is the facade, this is what they show, but this is actually is. So I taught my kids that like, okay, they say that they like us, just listen to them, but don't believe anything of it, even in one second. So I guess not to discourage uh, Leah or other things, but I was, you know, I started to understand, I play around it. That's, that's a word like, okay, it's, it's about respect, right? I don't, I told my kids like, if I smile at you, smile at them. But we are always, you know, in our guard. Don't lose your guard. You just, you know, that's the way it is explained to them the history and the dynamics of living in the US. But again, the, the good thing with the US, what the difference is the law, like, and the fight, the opportunity to fight in France or in Europe, you can't even fight. In the US, I would always fight. And my friends who know me so well, it was like, what's your fight again, Regis? It was like, yes, I fight for everything, even for my ticket, right? My speeding ticket. Mm -hmm. I went to the court. It was like, nope, here you have a court. And once it was dismissed because the judge didn't come. And they said, like, why do you like to fight? It was like, yes, because I'm in a, in a, you know, in a country where I can fight. So I guess uh, going back to the point, I think it's, um, you need to teach your kids. I teach my kids, like this is, I'm telling them the truth, right? Like they can't be this, they can't be that. Learn how to navigate the system. My kids know to hang out with kids of color, black, Latinos, and then with white, because we go to a white church over there. So we know, and we understand. We just like, we smile at them when we say like, oh, you guys are this, this, and we smile and we, you know, yeah. we know who, who we are. And right. just be respectful and teach them the law, right? To, to follow the law and um, not to, well, they were not perfect kids. My kids did a lot of SHIT in the US. They're not the, the you know, like, ooh, they were caught smoking uh. e-cig, they were caught with marijuana at school. I've experienced all of that, but that's part of the US, you know, they didn't choose to, to be there. I brought them there. So I need to take the highs and lows for the US. So it's not perfect, but at least um, you can voice your opinion. Here in Madagascar, I need to shut up all the time. There's a lot of things I, I see that are not the way I should be, but I don't want to go to prison. And I just keep my mouth, my mouth shut. So anyway, sorry about the long comment. <laughs> that, was, that was very important, sis. Thank you for, for sharing with us. Um, and that always kind of brings us back to privilege in the United States, right? The fact that we can voice our opinions and fight without being arrested. I mean, bar in mind, yes, there is a police brutality issue, investigations, the government itself uses the military, uh, the CIA, the FBI in shady ways to prosecute our communities. Um, we have Guantanamo Bay, you can still disappear. We have, uh, what is it, Snowden, who will never come back to the United States because he's wanted by our government. So yes, you can fight up to a certain point, right? COINTELPRO, our government literally assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. family. Um, look into the civil lawsuit 
Um, there's a lot of things that our government does. I'm just saying we're not perfect. But, but yes, this is, here majority... in Madagascar, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but here in Madagascar, they put in prison, if you put a, a post on Facebook, that is against the government. Can you believe that right now? We I have an inundation that. now. Yes, in, in, an inundation now. And because they sold um, the pieces of land, if you go in the internet now, uh, and then uh, if you go in the internet, we are in underwater now because they sold the pieces of land and uh, illegally, illegal constructions and everything. So if you comment on that, that we have the law called cyber criminality and they will take you to your home and you because it's the government that put you in jail. So, I mean, it's hard for me to go back to a system of mine like that because I love talking on Facebook. And guess what? I can't do live right now. I was asked to silence, to keep silent. You know, there's a lot of things. That's why I, I don't put this on my profile because here I talk too much and um, I, I'm glad it's in English. I may have a hard time to, you know, to understand what I'm saying here. But still, I know I, I, when I told people the U.S. is not, you know, they say, because we picture it as a perfect, uh, country and was like, no, it's not perfect. There's a struggle, but at least you won't go to jail for what you say on Facebook. I mean, I don't know. Anyway, sorry again. No, no, never a reason to apologize, sis. Um, speaking truth, right? And the governments, depending on where you are, have that power to surveil you. Um, going back to flow, we are continuing to reflect on intersectionality, a part of our identity that might have influenced our lives during the last two weeks. Carolyn, anything you'd like to reflect upon? I don't know that I, I have anything to share really. So I'll just not. No problem, thank you. Um, Rita. Well, um... I would like to point out that um, before I came to the US, I didn't know that I was black. I didn't know that I was different because we are always told that we are one in Madagascar. I didn't know that I was a minority until I studied the, you know, the racial and ethnicity things in the US. And now I see that in everyday life here in Madagascar. So I'm, I'm among the minority. Usually people in Madagascar, they call, they wanted to be like Asian, like lighter skin, lighter skin people. And uh, they are the, the one who controls the country, the more uh, intellect people. And uh, people are surprised, like, why am I smart? And I am more of African, you know, I'm not as dark as my husband and my kids and my, you know, my fellow, but still I'm dark enough. I'm too dark to be smart and to have a degree and to articulate. And they ask like, why, whose child is she? What's her ancestor? So I didn't know that we, I was different until when I came back now and and they still keep telling people like, oh, we are one, we are the same. And I was like, no, we are not the same. You have the privilege. I struggled to get a position at the university because our work is for hiring is centralized. And even if I got a PhD from an American university and I was a former minister of education, they punished me not to hire me. And I was like, you know what? I don't care. I'm not going to lick anyone's butt. They said, okay, let's punish you. And I was like, that's okay. That's fine. Yours, your territory is Madagascar, but mine is the whole world. I know somewhere there's something for me, but I'm not going to beg on you. So I was waiting. I waited. I struggled. And thanks to my, you know, friends and my sis, like uh, Andrea, they helped me out for two years before I got hired. I mean, it's like, because I was, I have a, I, I can't be stubborn. And I blame the US on that. Because I said, like, I stick on my personality. I, you know, I was already stubborn before I left. And then when I spent 
13 years over there, you know, I started to be like, okay, this is what I believe. I stick to what I believe in. And um, I, I, I stick to that. I believe that there's something for me somewhere. If it's, it's not meant to be, it's not for me. So I waited. And I think the combination of who I am, what I studied, the struggles that I went through uh, made me who I am today. And I think uh, intersectionality matters. I think those experiences have shaped me, especially the struggles. And I can um, see myself from what you guys have shared with the trauma and stuff. I, um, I, I have um, a very bad body. I'm always sick. I'm, uh, you know, I always take medication. And that's okay, I accept that because since my childhood, I've had a health issue and I take that and um, we call it, it's on sale. My body is on sale, like all the medication is knocking, like all the diseases are knocking. Here I am, here I am. And then finally COVID is here. And I was like, okay, well, what shall I say? I'm just thankful I'm still alive and I can, you know, share. Uh, my lives here and we can um, exchange our struggles and listen to stories because this is a huge step towards healing and that knowing that you are not alone. So again, thank you so much. Uh, without the, this is a privilege, it's intersectionality. If I couldn't speak English, if I didn't get education in the US, I was not here today if I didn't meet all of you. So thank you so much, this is huge. Thank you, sis. Um, I think for this coyote, I'm going to go with my native privilege family. I did not realize how privileged I was to be a tribal member of Isleta, like my specific tribe. Um, We've always had our criticisms of our government politics or our services, and it's never perfect. But especially when COVID hit, I didn't understand how excellent our facilities were. So our facility is not a regular facility run by IHS, but it has been privatized. Um, I cannot quote you the exact legislation, but a couple years ago, uh, maybe 20 now, I don't know, family. Um, individual tribes had the ability to take their formerly run Indian Health Service Hospital or clinic and become private. So they can get a certain amount of grant funding, but essentially it's run by the tribe. And that is what my facility is. And we have eye, dental, behavioral health, um, podiatry, and general care. Um, and, you know, heaven forbid, I'm I, last year when I was visiting our aunties in Flagstaff, I had my kidney stone. And so I ended up in the emergency room. So you contact your our clinic. If you're from the Pueblo of Salada, you contact our clinic um, and they take care of it. They take care of the billing for that in emergency cases. You have to let them know right away and in a certain amount of time and there's paperwork and all this other jazz. But they will essentially, if you have to go to another facility, will take care of it. When I had my gastric bypass five, four years ago, five years will be this September, um, it went through Presbyterian Hospital. I had an amazing surgeon um, and that all went through a sleda. I did not have to pay a penny for that. And this week I had my own COVID scare. I had been sick since December 30th until about last Friday, maybe Sunday. I had sniffles. Like right now I have to blow my nose, but this is allergies. But I had had sniffles and I was sick for a while. And so we were afraid, oh, oh crap. What if this is COVID? What if it's a, a strain, you know? Um, and on Monday I had had a conversation with one of my siblings and we're talking about COVID. And I feel like my brain's powerful. And I literally took away my own sense of taste that afternoon. Like I can remember the moment my tongue tingled and I ran to the kitchen and I was licking Funyuns and trying to taste orange juice and I could not taste for about three hours. I freaked out. 
ran to the bedroom, tried to smell my cologne. At first, I could smell it. Neil said, I overwhelm my olfactory glands. So if you immerse yourself in too much scent, you'll kill your smell, which is what I did. So in my panic, um, and I was exhibiting symptoms and I was having a panic attack, I had to calm down. I contacted Neil and we did everything you're supposed to do, right? I contacted my clinic and they asked me questions and I had told them about being sick and that lost my head taste and they made me an appointment for the next morning. So in a state where it is impossible to get in-store testing, where when you call your local hospitals, it could be a week out to get a COVID test. I was literally able at 3.30 in the afternoon, be able to secure an appointment the next morning at 8.45. On top of that, my partner and I um, both had tests and he is also uh, native. He's actually Blackfeet. Um, And so he is eligible to be seen in my clinic because he's been seen at IHS. So he has a record with Indian Health Services. Um, He's also a descendant of Blackfeet Nation. So he has descendancy papers family. And again, it goes back to certificate of Indian blood and the federal government tried to breed us out. And depending on what tribe you can be a member or not, depending on how much blood you have of each tribe. It's very complicated because they were trying to exterminate us. So we both were able to be sitting at the clinic. We we're both able to get appointments and you drive to the back of the facility and you're sitting in a car and they'll come out to your car with paperwork. And it was not the evasive swab test that I've been hearing where they stick it up and it hurts. It was actually very gentle. They just swabbed the inside of each of our nostrils and had us wait for 10 minutes. And we took the test and they came back with the good news that we were both negative. But that was privilege itself, family, to be able to get access to a test so quickly for our insurance to be billed. My partner does have good insurance with his work, um, so he bills his insurance. And this coyote is a graduate assistant, so have student insurance. Um, But all in all, our tribe is able to provide us with excellent service. And in my naivety, I assume that all Native Americans had access to such facilities. But when I talk to my siblings from around the world, I realize it depends on your tribe. It depends on whether or not you have a casino. It depends on whether or not it's run by IHS or whether or not you're from the Navajo Nation, which has over 300,000 members versus a tribe like Asleta that has over 3,000. So I'm just saying, family, I've really been reflecting on my privilege as a Native American person who has health care through my tribe. And I'm asking us during a pandemic, a global pandemic that has taken millions of lives, why can we not in the United States provide healthcare for all of our peoples? All right, family, we are gonna go ahead and go on to the next segment today. Hashtag privilege saves. The lived experiences of educational warriors matter. During this segment, family, each one of our amazing siblings reflects on an aspect of privilege that they enjoy. Tamay, sis, you are up. My privilege, oh my goodness. (laughs) The privilege that I lean into is knowing that I'm not powerless. That's the privilege that I lean into, knowing that I'm not powerless. And and for me, that's a privilege because I'm always reminded from day to day of something that people think they have power over me because because they are part of the dominant culture or because of a title they have. And for me, it's just, my privilege is I don't have to I don't have to make somebody else look bad so I can look good. That's the privilege I have because I know who I am and I love who I am. And I think that's a privilege, having that sense of self, self love in the way that I've been cultivating it. To me, that's a privilege because when I engage people sometimes and they say some, some cruel things to me, I just think like, wow, you really don't love yourself. That's what I think. Like, you really don't love you. And 
So I just, my privilege is knowing I'm not powerless, that I have power because it's within me and it, it connects me to other people, amazing people like you, Drea. <laughs> and now I met um, Carolyn and um, Leah and Rija. So it's like, I, I'm just sitting here. This has been a privilege, right? When you are connected to your light inside of you, and it draws you to the light of other people outside of you. That is a privilege. So that I, that's the privilege I am staying with because I've been inspired listening, right? Not just engaging and contributing, but really listening. I've been so inspired um, with this process. So yeah, that's my privilege. So Leah, you wanna go next? Leah. She might have stepped away to go tech, uh, check out her children. Carolyn, did you want to jump in on this segment? Well, I don't know that I have anything specific to share for the past few weeks, um, but I would share um, that my privilege in knowing Andrea and um, she pulls me into these uh, podcasts and things. I think that's where my, um, my privilege lies in my friends. And I, you know, I, I'm really more of a listener um, so far in this podcast so I don't really have a whole lot more to share than that. Thank you so much for sharing, sis. We appreciate you and I love, I love you so much because you rescue me on the daily. I'm like, all right, Carolyn and I are gonna do this. <laughs> That's how family works, family. It's really about surrounding yourselves with people <clears throat> who love and appreciate you. Yeah. Leah, are you here? Yeah, sorry, I, I took uh, a cup of water. No worries. Um, uh, is it again with privilege? Yes. Is it still privilege? Okay. Um, I mean, I've been in the podcast for like, how many episodes already? Nine. Nine, yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm gonna say this over and over again because I don't have, when it comes to privilege, I don't really have anything else you know, in mine right now. But like having international sisterhood is amazingly uh, a plus point for me. Like at least now being in academia, woman academia makes me realize that how important international network is because, you know, and this might sound like very, um, very biased, uh, but, even speaking the lang English language is a privilege for Indonesians. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like a lot of uh, professors at in, in, in Indonesian universities are required, you know, to write in international journals and, you know, in Scopus index journals and things like that. And all of those require us to have international, both international net network and speak the language. And so I think I'm, well, in a way, I have this too, and so I think it's some kind of a privilege to me because I know a lot of you know fellow um, friends here who are all, who are also teaching at a university uh, do not have this too, or at least are still working on this too. So, yeah, I don't know. Does that answer the question, Andrea? Absolutely, sis. Absolutely. On to you, Rija. Yes, thank you. And uh, yes, I share the um, <clears throat> uh, opinion of um, Leah, of my sister Leah. Uh, yes, speaking English is a privilege without that wow. language, without being, you know, without spending years in the US, I wouldn't be here today. And um, um, I would like to make a quick comment uh, regarding. Um, 
Caroline's um, input on listening. And uh, I am right about artists. They are the best. They are good listeners, right? They are like um, special ears and special heart. They don't talk much. They listen a lot and you can, they are reliable. You can rely on them. I don't know you, but I can, I was like, okay, is she like the one I met? You know, the ones I met? Because I, and she says it herself, she said it herself earlier, like I'm more of a listener. And yes, I have a few friends um, who are artists. I met a few of them. I used to attend a different, um, you know, the um, uh, activities like the Albuquerque Folk Festival, all the small markets during the winter market or Christmas, you know, all of those. I used to sell art from Madagascar. So I met oh. a few of them. Yes, yes, in Albuquerque. And I went until Taos, uh, until uh, where? Um, in uh, Corrales, in, uh, in the small, in uh, the south, uh, what is it? Um, where's the New Mexico State University? In, in Las Cruces. Las Cruces, yes. And in Santa Fe, in Española. In uh, where's the lab in Los Alamos? Oh. I attended craft fair and art fair over there. So I met artists, and um, they're always like that very supportive, quiet, and very insightful, and listeners, good listeners. So, yes, and it's, it's interesting because I like that's a problem with researcher. You have a theory inside your head, and um, you see someone, and you're like, okay is the theory going to apply to this one, right? Because you have a certain <laughs> set of like this, but I mean, it's not necessarily a stereotype negatively, but you know, kind of like that. And um, so we talk, and that's a privilege, right? To know people, to, to have met many kinds of people. The problem with um, academics nowadays is that they hang out with people who are like them. I don't think like that. I think that's wrong. I think the world is heterogeneous, right? You meet, you should meet different people. The real world is made of different people with different backgrounds. So I hang out with um, uh, different people from different beliefs and so on. And um, my privilege here is again, um, now we have about in the capital city, we experienced um, um, uh, huge um, rains and uh, about 10,000 people don't have um, shelters right now. They are put in a stadium, different stadiums, and um, about 10 people died from the rain because of housing. They live in a housing, you know, structure that is not uh, secured. And I see them on TV and I feel um, I am privileged to live in a, you know, in a house far away from the uh, neighborhood that is uh, flooded. Um, and I have the opportunity even if I'm still sick. Usually people who are sick with COVID um, can't afford the food that they want, the medicine that support them, like the different vitamins and um, all those makes you strength, strong. So I can afford that. Our uh, maid uh, has been sick since before Christmas and she's not established yet. She's not fully recovered because she didn't have enough food. You can't afford that. So all of that are privilege um, uh, for me. And especially when you are sick, you could barely go to the bathroom and then you start to get weak again. That's how COVID is. You can't you can barely move around in the house. It's bad, people. When I say it's bad, it's really bad. Um, I, I'm not like sick, sick, but I feel weak and that bothers me especially uh, when I wanted to do something. 
So then without leaving my house, I can have the opportunity to hear stories of my sisters all around the world. That is privilege. Being sick and yet I can still express and I can still share my struggles and I can still communicate with people from far away, like we are 10,000 kilometers apart. That's a privilege. So I'm so thankful for all of you. Thank you for being you. Thank you for joining this podcast. Thank you for being you, sis. Um, wow. That's a lot to reflect on. I guess my privilege is uh, the privilege of my partner and the privilege of inherited class. So I always talk about being a second generation college graduate, um, that I am literally the sum of my ancestors' dreams, like the sacrifices my grandparents made so that all of her children could go to college. All my, both of my grandparents made sacrifices for that. The training and sacrifices my parents ensured and making sure that I came out the way I did, right? Um, that was all hard earned by class. Uh, my grandmother started the nest eggs, the family continued the tradition, and I was born in a privilege. So yes, I have a certain amount of success and my partner and I work incredibly hard, but I am living a dream that my parents worked for. Um, and that is, also the the type of viewpoint that I try to help my peers realize. So I'm an Ivy League graduate and the other Native American students who are my peers, many of us come from privilege, some do not. Some are just amazing brilliance. Um, it didn't have the same sort of monetary investment um, that I did. But some of my peers did come from private schools like I did um, and had training and tutoring and summer camps and European trips and opera and this coyote is crazy. Um, and that allows me to start life at a different starting point than the rest of my cousins on the reservation. And when my partner and I got married, when we started our life, we were able to buy our house and move in a month after we got married. We had lived with my mom for a year on the res, saving up money. I was a bank teller for a year before I became a school teacher and I taught at Laguna Middle School and my partner became an engineer at a firm. But we were able to buy our house a month within getting married. No, I'm sorry, family. <laughs> I'm fibbing. We bought our house in April and we didn't get married until July. <laughs> so we bought our house before we got married. But that was privilege. And right now during a pandemic, when I'm having a panic attack and I'm currently a ninth year doctoral candidate, I have not had a full-time job family in nine years. I make $20,000 a year at a GA ship that pays 1500 a month. When I teach adjunct classes, I make $2,800 for 16 weeks of work. And that is not a lot, but I still have this. And that is because my partner is a brilliant engineer who is paid very well for his field because he has 17 years of experience as an electrical engineer. He's a senior engineer and he is a twice over Ivy League graduate. So he knows his shit family, he is brilliant. And when this coyote has no money in January, May and August, because I live on student loans and the adjunct classes I can cobble together. He is literally able to pay my bills during those months. And that is privilege, not only that has allowed me to continue to be a student and graduate, knock on wood in two years family, but when I have my PTSD attacks and I cannot function and I am stuck in my room, I do not have to worry that our bills aren't gonna be paid because my partner and I have family support. When I cannot make my bills family, this coyote has a mom who definitely helps me out. And the privileges that I am talking about now for Native American people 
are unheard of. Most of us do not have support networks, do not have family members who can command cash, command a loan, command um, the privilege of a good credit score. And unfortunately, family, what is a huge privilege on, on, on the reservation and makes me part of the 1% is what upper and middle class white families have enjoyed for decades. And I would like to remind our audience that the United States is still and has been a majority white population. So when the vast majority of people have this type of inherited wealth and generation after generation enjoy those opportunities, that is what people of color, poor white communities, marginalized communities are fighting for that same comfort, safety, security, and hope for their children. So dear family, I'm asking you to please reflect on your own privilege and ask yourself, maybe the people around me that I might have biases or prejudices about might not have the same background, might not have the same access, or might not have the same experiences that I have. Now we're going to go on to our next section, family. Segment four, hashtag whiteness, hashtag dear white family. Loving critical reflections from your friendly neighborhood and global superhero coyote family. In this segment, family, we directly talk to our dear white family and ask them to reflect um, on something that has to do with our lives. Sis to May, you are up. <laughs> this one is Dear White Family. Oh my goodness. <sighs> so what would I say to my dear white family? <sighs> Well, I've been in conversations with some of my white family and one person um, made a comment that how they really just don't have time to attend to some of the social issues of the world um, that's happening. And, and they were really comfortable with saying that and yet they don't like to acknowledge their white privilege. So dear white family, I would like to say, if you can make a decision to not address something that's happening globally in the world and specifically even to black people, um, because I, I, I hear a lot from my white family, you know, all lives matter. Yeah, all lives matter when all lives matter, right? But right now we can see that all lives do not matter. So dear white family, I would ask that you would recognize your privilege to even fix your mouth to say that you don't have the time to commit to addressing these social issues in the presence of your BIPOC family. That's it. Cecilia? Okay, uh, dear white family, uh, so in my experience as a scholarship seeker, I've met a lot of uh, people who are scared of going to your country in the US because of, you know, the stories how, you know, the prejudice and the racism that's currently going on and I think for us, from a lot of other countries outside of the U.S., I think it's <clears throat> it uh, it ruined the reputation of the country that we always have that we you know used to have about you know we used to believe that America is like you know superpower country you know with lots of educated people blah 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 and they're very you know di diverse and so the consequence the con the logical consequence of you know living in a diverse in a huge diverse uh, population is that, you know, you're more acceptable other people's, you know, differences. So, but the reality sometimes does not show the same. And so 
that's probably the lack of <clears throat> education that you have about our country or our, about our culture or religion or whatever you know situation that's, that we have you know which is very understandable but you know it would be more it would be better for all of us if you open your eyes about you know, the richness of other people's culture, you know, how people live in other cultures. And, you know, there's no point, there's, it's not very polite to mock other people's, you know, culture and, you know, the background of education that you, we have. The reason for, I think, like for me, myself, the reason we go to the US is because we believe that education in, in the US is, you know, better than in our country. But if we have to struggle with something that like we consider very basic here, like, you know, if you're different then you have to treat me like a human being, but you still have to treat me like a human being. That's I think something a very basic concept, but we have to struggle with that there. It does not reflect the, you know, the good reputation of the country that we used to have before go to the country, before going to the country. And so I think, you know, just be more open, you know, minded about other people, other people's culture. That's it. Is this Rita? Yes, sorry. My, I was taking medication. <laughs> um, yes, do um, white families. Um, I've known you for a while. I um, hang out with you. Uh, I cannot say that I perfectly know you, but um, I don't have anything against you. I know you have your strength. I know you have your weaknesses, but show us your strength. Show us that, um, you can embrace change and you can embrace diversity. You can celebrate our differences because we can't do this without your help. We need each other on earth. I am not gonna say like we can't, fun we can't function without you because when my people in Madagascar here are angry, they say like, go home you foreigners. I don't do that. I don't think like that. I think we need each other. We need to respect each other and we need to share the privilege. Don't hold it to yourself. It's enough. The earth is big. Mother Earth provides us many. And um, we are not going to steal what should not go to us. We just need our share fair, fair share. Sorry. So I know. Uh, you can do this, and some of you are already becoming our allies and uh, try to understand this. So I know you are wise, I know you can think, and I know you can change this world with us. So wake up, let's get together, stand up and fight for the sake of the humanity, for this global earth that we share together. Thank you. Dear wife family, this is your coyote. And I'm asking you to go out and make friends. I want you to go out and make an authentic relationship with someone that might freak you out someone you might have been scared of before, someone you might not have wanted to approach, but at the end of the day is just another human person like yourself. Because family, that is how I believe we're gonna actually change the world. My amazing siblings from around the world come from all walks of life, from many countries, many different continents, many different religions, background, races, citizenships. But at the end of the day, we're all educators, we're all activists, we're all parents, we're all aunties. We're all people with big dreams, hoping that our families are going to have a little safety and security. 
So I'm asking you, dear wife family, go out there and make some friends. And I'm not talking about the, I have a black friend, I have a Muslim friend, I have a two-spirited friend. I'm talking about, do you know their names, their kids' names? Do you know how old they are, what schools they went to, what their birthdays are? Do you know their daily lives, their hopes, their dreams, and their troubles? And can you do something to help? I have been weaponizing my privilege basically since COVID started, family, to make sure that my siblings around the world have a lifeline sometimes, especially during this uncertainty. Maybe it's volunteering to help tutor one of my brothers for his adults exam as he's preparing to leave his country with his hopes of pursuing his PhD. Whether it's sending a couple bucks when I can to one of my siblings around the world because there's a birthday coming up with one of my nieces or nephews. Or whether it's just looking over one of my former students' resumes to help them prepare for a job. I can donate these small pockets of time. I can create these relationships, these friendships that turn into family because that's what's important to me. When we're all successful, all of our lives get better. All right, family, we are going to go ahead and go to the next section. We are doing great. All right, family, this is segment number five. We reflect on tenet number three. In order to keep our superpowers, we must maintain a humanizing balance between our minds, bodies, and spirits. So our question, how do we balance our lives in this upcoming year? Are we, family, are we keeping our superpowers intact? What do we think? How did we do the last two weeks? Sister May? You know, these are very thoughtful, thought-provoking questions. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, I was I was literally like pulling my hair back with that one. Like, <laughs> what are we doing? Wait, no, this is um I have to do better. I'll, I'll just start there and say I have to do better when it comes to the balance because, for example, today I have been like in meetings back to back and had little pockets of time to really nurture myself. So that's not good balance. And but I, I unbalanced myself in ways where, um, because last year, <coughs> the semester was really hard. And it was hard because I experienced a number of things that really started triggering my PTSD. And so I had to just take off time and just focus on my health. So one of the ways I decided to balance was when I engage people because I found that I have this, you know, I love to help people and listen to them and talk, but I found that sometimes people, they weren't always positive with the things they wanted to talk about. And then after they finished sharing with me, then I'm like feeling heavy because essentially what they had did was just dumped all over me. And, you know, so it left me feeling like super heavy you know, and I just decided that I will give people that one opportunity, honestly. Everyone has a time and space where they might need to say something, but I'm not big on people talking about people, right? So if, we're, if you wanna talk about a person to me, then make sure that's a person you can invite into the conversation. Make sure that's a person that whatever you're saying to me, or you would like to say to me, you're comfortable saying in front of them. Because just from everything like sitting here tonight and listening, like I said, um, to everything you were all saying, that's what we need to do. Like just continuously lift each other up, pull each other up and not look at the other like we're less than or better than. So my balance is making sure I'm surrounded by people that they, if they have to, they'll call me on the um, carpet. <laughs> they'll pull me and say, I'm so may, uh, you need to check yourself. 
right? So that's what I appreciate. And that's how I'm balancing. But I am, I don't, I won't say failing. I'm just not doing good in that, that other area of making sure I carve out enough space for me so I can nurture myself in the ways that I need to, because it's, it's too late for me to be trying to nurture myself at this time. <laughs> That's it for me. Thank you, sis. Leah? Okay, so it's my turn now, huh? <clears throat> uh, what am I trying? Wait, can you repeat the question? Sorry. We're reflecting on whether or not we have a humanizing balance because as superheroes, we have to keep our superpowers by maintaining a humanizing humanizing balance between our mind body and spirit yeah oh right. How's balance? um i think well i somewhat agree with tame in this case but i think like uh the only thing uh more from that is that i need to take care of my bodies like seriously i i can't wait like i've been sick for I don't know, maybe once a month, there's always something, it's the cold, it's the flu, it's the dizziness, it's, it's always something. So I think my, it's a scream for help from my body. And I now realize that, you know, how much taking care of the body helps, you know, our intention of doing this and that, you know, considering that I have so many plans, future plans for myself, my family and my kids, I think it's, not fair if I re disregard the importance of you know taking care of the body and and I'm feeling really bad about this I haven't really worked out for I don't know maybe a semester more than a semester actually it's just being the role of you know being a mother and a full-time instructor at the university like really takes away all of the energy I guess you could say uh, and so by the time I get home, it's, you know, it's only the kids and nothing else, like seriously, nothing else. I have met, you know, it's funny that I have tried to make some time, some schedules for working out, but it's never really, you know, there's always this like, uh, you know, resolutions for 2022, you know, I have to work out at least three times a week and then, you know, at the time you make the resolutions, it's always, you know, you know, you have that, you're very certain that you're going to do that. But the next day, you know, reality hits, you know, laundry, you know, kids screaming here and there, you know, you have to, everything to take care of, it's, it's just too much to work on. So for all this time, I've been like putting work out aside and, it's, I feel bad, like, in, and I think my body needs help very soon. And so, yeah, I think I need to work on that. Don't we all, sis, for real, don't we all? I know. Thank you so much. Sis, Carolyn, do you have anything you want to comment on as far as balancing? Well, I think that, um, as a person living with depression, balance is something that is always a struggle. And so I will just say that, um, yeah, it's a struggle. It's something I need to do better with. Um, yeah, that's really about all I have to say. But we're going to work on it together, family, and yes. also in increments, like every, that's the other thing, just a reminder, family, to only compare yourself to yourself, right? Like, right. I feel better this week because I only collapsed or could not work two days this week. Hold on, let me count them. One day, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay, fine. Two and a half week days. But last week, it was more like, Okay, like two and a half days. But hey, at least it wasn't three days this week. So I'm just saying, family, we have to measure ourselves by ourselves. And sis, you were a badass. And you went to the classroom this week. We cannot forget that. That's a huge victory. Yes. The thing, family. There's always there's always an upside. Ah, sunny side. 
All right, family. I forgot the prompt already. Um. Oh, balance. Nope. I'm shit at balance. I'm shit. But that's okay. Um. I've also learned it comes to priorities. I am very privileged, like I said, to have my partner to love and support me. But I also work out a lot. Like, I'm on the treadmill for an hour and a half a day. We're going to the gym to lift for an hour twice a week. I do the YouTube yoga with you guys for 20 minutes every morning. And then I do my own yoga for 20 more minutes. And I started up with Kyla again at lunch on Wednesdays. So I spend like three to four hours a day working out, which is a lot because I eat a lot. Oh my gosh, you guys, I ate like so much chocolate, so many cookies and gained four pounds up and down, up and down, up and down, gained and lost. So like I work out a lot, but I also eat a lot and I'm working on that family. So my balance is shit, but I'm also, I was honest, I was stressed out this week. And it was the holidays. So you know this coyote fucking ate. You guys saw all the pictures? And I don't know what's up with YouTube, but I don't know. You guys love the food ones for Rogue Family. Those are like my most popular video videos. There's like 1,500 hits for like food. I don't know. I wish you would do that with our critical race videos. I'm just saying. Um, but yeah, I'm going to work on balance with everyone else. All right, family. Let us see our pitch of the week so during this segment family we each go through our pitch of the week um it's sometimes it is a charity that we're affiliated with hint hint um other times it could be our business this coyote is always pitching our consulting group um or it could be a project we're currently working on who would like to get us started Actually, can I start? Sorry. Sure. I just typed, um, you know, I said I wanted to leave in the comment in the chat section, but you know, I'm just gonna do this for real quick. Um, there are, I think, families around the world. So I'm currently working on a literacy project for uh, children, underprivileged children in isolated parts of North Sumatra. And I have been distributing books, uh, sorry, children books. And uh, I actually got creative, Andrea, a couple of weeks ago, I added some toys, like small toys, like cheap toys. And they're very excited about it. And, you know, I've, I thought like, seeing how many, how, you know, cheap uh, used kids books in the US uh, a couple of years ago, uh, made me think that, you know, it, it would be very nice if, you know, this friends and family contribute, like, you know, donating their used children books that they have maybe at home so that we can send it, distribute, distribute it to, you know, kids uh, around, you know, the area that I'm living right now. And it will be very helpful. And they they cherish the, for them, it's, uh, you know, priceless gift. They cherish it so much. And they actually made me promise that they have I will come again next, you know, few weeks. And I said, yes, but I'm actually worried about, you know, if I can give them more books or not. But anyway, if you're interested in, you know, helping out the project, you, you can donate your used books or maybe, you know, any penny that you have, anything will be very helpful for these kids. And so, uh, you know, we will really appreciate it if you can help by any means possible. Also, I'm working on establishing uh, a, business, a family business to support, you know, of course, my family and the, uh, the projects I uh, work on right now by, you know, selling uh, used baby clothes, which is very uh, rare. I can say rare here because I so far I haven't seen any thrift store that specializes in selling used baby clothes. So, you know, if you maybe have a grown up, uh, sorry, a kids that already outgrow their, you know, baby clothes, you can, you know, donate them to Andrea and uh, we will 
work on sending it, you know, shipping it from the US uh, to Indonesia, which takes lots of money. So if you prefer to donate, um, you know, bucks to that's money, uh, that's great too. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. And thank you again. We'll see you in two weeks. Oh, yeah. Bye right. bye, well, everyone. Thank you so much. It's great uh, meeting you guys here. I'll hope to, inshallah, I'll join the next podcast, inshallah. Bye. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you. Tame, I believe it's your turn. Yeah, thank you. So that was really, um, I don't have anything I'm working on at the moment. But I would like to find out more information to see how I can support Leah and what she's doing. Yes, um, through the nonprofit, I would like that. So I'll get some more information afterwards. Oh, absolutely. But why don't you go ahead and give um, your partner's nonprofit a shout out as well as your website? Oh, oh right, right, right. <laughs> okay, so check out Worth Shop. And it's actually just recently been changed. It is officially Worth Justice Inc. And it's a nonprofit. And the whole basis is just to affirm worth and change lives, right? And to help people who don't see a place for themselves in the world to know that they are loved, they are heard, and that they will be seen and can achieve what they need to achieve in life. Um, so that website is worthshopinc.org. W-O-R-T-H-S-H-O-P-I-N-C dot O-R-G. And my partner, um, Daryl Varlek Butler, we co-founded it together, but he is the executive director and he runs the programs. And so go check it out. And that's why I want to see how I can also partner with Leah <laughs> and connect them. All right, thanks. Thank you so much. Sis Carolyn, did you have anyone you want to give a shout out to? Oh, wait, you're muted, I think. There we go. My dog was playing with her toy, so I had to mute. Um, <laughs> I will give a shout out to Enchantment Chihuahua Rescue. Um, they are who I got my two little dogs from and who I continue to volunteer with. Um, and they place uh, chihuahuas. We uh, do, um, I can't think of the word right now, but we, what? Meet and greets? We do meet and greets um, two times a month and um, bring little dogs that are in, I still can't think of the word. Um, I have these brain blockages sometimes, anyway. Um, and yeah, so that's They're all. Open for adoption. It is the cutest thing, family. So we've met them. A lot of times they meet over there at uh, both my cat's and dog's favorite bar bakery. It's called Wolfgang Bakery, usually the one on the west side, Mama Antonio is where they meet, but they have all these beautiful dogs up for adoption, and you can play with them, you can see them romping around, you get more information, and they also provide medical services, occasionally family, um, depending on their budget, so please visit their website and be generous, because our furry friends are family as well. Thank you so yeah. much. And, um just to piggyback off of the Betty White Challenge, um, celebrating her 100th birthday, you can go to Enchantment Chihuahua Rescue um, and donate um, on the website. Thank you. Thank you. Rija, sis, you're up. Sorry, I, I was doing my sauna. I think for my uh, my COVID, you need to do into um, a pot with hot water to get some um, energy for this COVID thing. Um, 
Well, I don't have a specific uh, cause, except I, I support Leah. I know how hard is it to get some uh, books in uh, developing countries or in countries where reading is not our culture. I struggle here to, to give reading to my students. They could barely read two pages. And what we read is scholastic, like third grader or fourth grader. When I told them and they said, like, really? And it was like, yes, it's for third grader because we are not used to read them. It's not only it's because in English, but it's reading itself is not part of our culture. So if they don't have the patience to read or if they don't have the skills and it's not something that is interesting to my people. And uh, I know it's, a, it's an issue when people uh, wanted to ship books from here, but then they charge you a lot of money for the customs. So if there's a lot of donations at the, um, at the, you know, shipped here, and then they're stuck at the customs because the government didn't want to cooperate. Like it should be free just to, because those are donations and people stop asking and stop shipping because it doesn't matter. You can, um, they don't understand it. Let's say that at this point. So that's why I don't really ask for, you know, what kind of help. And I'm still thinking because fair, fair versa, there's something that we need to support, and uh, but I don't know yet. Uh, but I love that you guys um, do for the animals and for the kids who read. Since I'm a teacher, I'm an educator. I support um, the well-being for the humanity and even the animals, the plants. Uh, we are struggling here with the climate uh, change in Madagascar. So um, I think any causes that um, help us build um, a better uh, earth, uh, I would appreciate. So thank you for your, all of your hard work. And that concludes our amazing podcast of hashtag Coyotes Family of Global Superheroes. Don't forget, family, to visit our website, abetaconsulting.com. Join us here every two weeks. Also, we have plenty of volunteers, um, positions open for our organization, as well as our budding nonprofit family. That is official. Thank you so much to our amazing sis, Valentina Zapata, for putting our handbook together and wrangling this coyote. Um, and special thank you, of course, to my sis, Carolyn, the Abeta Consulting Group Chief Communication Officer. Shout out to Kyla Charlie, our Chief Operating Officer for the Abeta Consulting Group, to my amazing sisters who joined us here this evening. Don't forget to follow us on social media. Dr. Rija Su Adria Maniana, hashtag Dr. Rija. She is on Facebook family. This Coyote at Drea Beta on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, and Clubhouse. Don't forget to visit this Coyote tomorrow at 11 a.m. at Clubhouse. I'm going to be a guest speaker on Ask a Native along alongside BJ Rainbow, hosted by my brother, the amazing Tracy Peterson. And shout out to our brand new sister who is joining this amazing team, Tomei Douglas. Um, Barlek Butler, truth teller, hashtag Tomei's truth. She is on social media family, also on Facebook. And don't forget to visit her website, www.worthshopinc.org. Family, as per tradition, does anyone have any final comments? They'd love to give our global family. Sounds like that's it for this evening. I wish everyone a good night and don't forget to join us back here every two weeks.